What's up my stats stars? I'm Michael Prunchak and in this video, I wanna tackle some multiple choice questions to help prepare you for the AP Statistics exam. So in this video, I'm gonna present a multiple choice question. Go ahead and pause the video, try it on your own, see what you could come up with, and then hit play and I will very briefly go over the solution and the answer. All right, best of luck, hopefully you enjoy. All right, so let's get ready to jump into the AP Statistics Practice Multiple Choice Questions Part 3. We're gonna tackle questions 21 through 30. All right, here is question 21. I'm gonna go ahead and show it, pause it, try it on your own, and then hit play for the answer. All right, the correct answer is D, an experiment with a completely randomized design. Basically, based on what we see here, we saw that we had a large group of participants, and it cle pretty clearly says that half were given a protein supplement, and then the ones that were not were given a placebo. It didn't say anything had to do with blocking. Blocking would be if they said, hey, we took the females and the males separately of the males, half got the placebo, half got the nutrient. Of the females, half got the placebo, half got the nutrient. That would be blocking based on gender. There was no other variable that we were blocking on, so it's not blocking. Nobody was matched. It wasn't like everybody took the pill for a week and then took the placebo for a week. That would be a matched pair design. Definitely not that. Not an observational study because everybody was given something to take. The moment you're giving people something to do, that becomes an observational study. It's clearly, clearly not a census. All right, let's move into question number 22. And the correct answer here is a cluster sample. Now, a lot of kids get this one wrong. They think it's a stratified sample. Now, here's the deal. It says that there are many employees across many different departments, which means there's a whole bunch of different departments, right? So maybe we have all these different departments and in all these different departments, we have a bunch of employees. So sorry for these terrible circles. Well, then it says the company randomly selects three departments. That's the key is they're not even selecting individuals. They're selecting three departments. So every department gets a number. They randomly select three of those departments and every employee in those departments becomes part of the sample. That's literally the definition of a cluster sample. A uh, stratify would be if they took maybe a couple from each. If it clearly said, hey, we took five employees from each department, that would become a stratified random sample. So hopefully that one is a pretty easy one as well. And question number 23. All right, this is a tough question. Hopefully you got it right, 752. But this is a tough question that involves some math. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our margin of error formula. The margin of error formula will come to looking for a single population proportion is the margin of error equals your Z star times the square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat divided by N. That's, of course, your standard error. Now we're going to fill in everything we know. We were told that we want to have a margin of error of 0.03. The Z star, which is based on 90% confident, right? Our Z star here is going to be based on 90% confident that they asked us to be. And if you use your NumWorks, your TID4, or you could look it up on one of your tables in your AP Stats reference guide, but it's 1.645. Hopefully you can be able to find that. It's not too, too bad. Now, the other question is, what do we do for P hat? Because we haven't even looked at a sample yet to know what to put there for P hat. So that's where we just use 0.5 and 0.5 because, well, we haven't even looked at a sample yet to even know what to put there. So it's no harm, no foul to just put 50-50 basically. Then it becomes a little bit of algebra. Hopefully you guys aren't too bad at algebra in order to solve this. But the first step is to divide the 1.645 over. That's going to undo that multiplication. Then we're going to square to get rid of the square root. And then we're going to multiply the n over because we can't solve for n in the denominator. So we're going to multiply it over right here. And then finally divide by the 0.03 divided by 1.645 all squared. And when you do that, you get approximately 752, which was the correct answer for this problem. So maybe a little bit more math work there than you want. A lot of kids would get this one wrong because they don't know how to do that math, but hopefully it's not too bad. All right, question 24. Here it is. Go ahead and read it and give it a try. All right, the correct answer here is C. So this is a question dealing with a confidence interval for the slope of a regression line. So what are we talking about in this problem? We're trying to determine how two variables, the first one being X is fertilizer, affects Y, the crop yield of a particular type of corn, right? Crop yield would be how much, you know, how many ears of corn you get, right? Whatever, they tell you how they measure in bushels per hectare. 
Okay, so the slope that we got is, you know, the, our slope from our samples can be smack dab in the middle of this interval. We add or subtract our margin of error, and we get this interval right here, which is where we believe the true slope of the population for the entire, all of the, you know, all of the crops, right, all of the fields not just our sample. We believe that the true population slope is somewhere in that interval, and that's exactly what C is saying. We're 95% confident that the crop yield increases on average 2.15 to 3.05 bushels per hectare for each kilogram increase in fertilizer. So remember, when you're working with slope, these numbers represent how much we expect the crop yield to change for based on you know one increase of fertilizer. So we expect the crop yield to go up somewhere between 2.15 to 3.05 per kilogram of fertilizer used. Now, if you read these other choices, they just don't make sense. First, A and B talk about probability. Confidence intervals have nothing to do with probability. If you're dealing with a problem with confidence intervals, I would never choose something that says probability. Now, E is really, really close to C, but it says decreases. If both of these were negative, then yes, we would be decreasing, but it's not, it's positive. Positive means that the, the uh, yield of crop is going up, not down. So that's why that one's wrong. And D also talks about the samples. It says we're 95% confident that any sample will give a result in our interval. No, no, no. Uh, confidence intervals aren't used to try to find what happens in a sample. Confidence interval user are, are used to try to figure out what happens in the true population, not just in the sample. So hopefully you got that one right. And let's move on to question number 25. All right, this is a pretty easy problem as long as you understand z-scores. Z-scores are a measurement of how far data is from the mean. Well, it doesn't matter if you change your conversions, if you change your units, like we're going from meters per second to kilograms per hour. Yes, the individual values in your data set are going to change by that conversion, but if your particular score or, or one student's particular score is negative 0.85, that means he or she is 0.85 standard deviations below the mean. Change the units all you want, and they are still going to be in that exact same position, 0.85 standard deviations below the mean. So hopefully that one makes sense, and it's a pretty easy one as long as you know and understand z-scores. And question number 26. All right, this one's not too, too bad. It wants us to talk about what is the best example of non-response bias. Now, you know, hopefully this is a pretty easy topic, non-response bias, but non-response bias is essentially when people do not respond and why they're not responding may make them different than those that do respond. And remember, what do we want when we have a sample? When we pick a sample, we want that sample to represent the population, which means we want that sample to reflect the population. So if that sample has people that don't respond and we allow them to not respond, well then we're not learning something that might be true about the population that we wanna learn about. So again, that's the idea here is if we allow people to choose not to respond, those people may have a very different opinion than those, those who that do respond. And if we allow that to happen, we're never gonna learn about that opinion. And that's what causes non-response bias to be, well, a problem. Hopefully that one makes sense to you. You know, as long as you understand some of that basic stuff out of unit three, you'll be okay. And question number 27. Now this is a question that a lot of kids tend to get wrong as well because they don't remember all the rules when it comes to combining standard deviations. Now, the key thing is you are not allowed to combine standard deviations at all. You are allowed to combine variance, which is just standard deviation squared. So for example, for A, it says that the standard deviation is 12. If I square it, boom, I got the variance for A. And eight squared, now that becomes the variance for B. Now the last rule we have to remember is that even though the problem is looking at the difference A minus B, variance always builds. Then we need a giant square root to convert that variance that we squared back to standard deviation. So here's the correct answer. That's how I got the 14.4 is that I take the variance for A, 12 squared, plus the variance for B. Why am I adding even though I'm subtracting? Because variance always builds. But then I need a giant square root around all that to get me from variance back to a standard deviation. So if you can remember that simple concept and a couple of those rules when it comes to combining standard deviations, you're going to be just fine. And question number 28. All right, a lot of readings. So you might have had one that paused for a while, but the correct answer here is A. So basically, if you read the question, they clearly are working with 200 subjects that were split up 100 versus 100. 
100 completed the task in the morning, the other 100 completed the task in the evening. Who determined where, who, you know, which went to which group as that was done randomly, of course. Now, a couple other key things we got to know that we make sure we choose the right answer here. So first, the idea is the null is always that the two means are the same. So that's why we definitely know that the means are the same. Now, quickly, let's eliminate E. E is a matched pairs t-test, and that is when your data is in pairs. So if we had one person that did it in the morning, and then maybe a month later did it in the evening, and then another person did it in the evening, then the morning, and then everybody else, and everybody basically did it twice. They did this task in the morning, they did it in the evening, and then we looked at their paired scores, that would be a match pair test. But that could have been the problem, but that's not how this is described. This is clearly 100 people did this, and another 100 people did that. So it's not a match pairs test. Now, why is it a t-test and not a z-test? Because it's said in the problem that the standard deviations we're collecting are that of the samples. So from the 100 that did in the morning, we got their mean, we got their standard deviation from that group of 100, not the population, that sample. And from the other sample of 100, from the evening, we got their mean, we got the standard deviation. When you are working with the standard deviations of your samples and not the standard deviations of the populations, you're going to be using T. It's way more accurate than using Z. Now, the final answer that's going to make the choice A here is that the alternative is not equal to. It never said in the problem, we think in the morning is faster, or we think in the evening is faster, or vice versa. It just said, hey, is there evidence of a difference? Meaning we don't care which one's bigger or smaller, we just care that they're different. So the null would be that they're the same, the alternative would be they're different. And it's definitely a t-test for the reasons that we explained. So hopefully that was a lot of reading, but that's a really easy one. If that you understand the basics of testing, you should be able to get it right. Question number 29. Another one with a lot of reading, but hopefully you chose D. It's the only one that actually makes sense. So we got a sample proportion of 38% and a margin of error of 3%, right? So that means we could take that 0.38, we could add, we could subtract that margin of error of 0.03. And you know, doing a little bit of math, if we go down, that takes us to 0.35. Whoa, not 0 0.53, 0 0.35, I know how to write. And then if we go up, it takes us to 0.41. Now, what we know is that that entire interval is below 50% which does provide evidence that less than half of Americans wish for student loan debt to be canceled out because that entire interval is below than 50%. So that's why D is correct. But let's make sure we understand why the other ones are incorrect. A says it's not possible to draw any conclusions because we're using a sample than a census. Um, not at all. That's the, kind of the whole point of this course is that you could use information from a random sample to draw inferences to the larger population. So that's wrong. B says it's not possible to draw any conclusions because this was not an experiment. Um, no, an experiment is needed to show a cause and effect relationship, but you could definitely learn some ideas and some proportions or some means, and you could learn something from a sample and apply it to a population without it being an experiment. C says that the proportion of all Americans that believe that student loan debt is the same as our sample 38%. That is certainly not true. That's the whole point of a conference interval is that our sample showed 38, but that doesn't mean that the population is going to be 38. And then E says, oh, 1,000 people is too small, so we shouldn't draw any conclusions from this super small sample. No, sample size doesn't really ever matter. Obviously, we don't want it to be super tiny because we need our sample to be big enough, but we never had a rule that says 1,000 is too small of a sample. So D is the only one that is correct. And question number 30. All right, hopefully you got this one right as well. Now, the key to understand this question is that in a box plot, each section is 25%. So the bottom here from the min to Q1 is 25%, from Q1 to the median is 25%, from median to Q3 is 25%, and this upper tail from Q3 to the max is 25%. So the, the spread is you know a, a wider region. It doesn't mean more data. Every region has the exact same amount of data. Wider just means more spread out. So if you look at choice A, A says, oh, there's there's more data below the median than there is above. No, it's the same. The, the median is in the middle, 50% above, 50% below. Yes, the left side is more spread out than the right side, but that's not what that's saying. There's not more scores on one side of the median than the other. It's 50-50. It's the same. B says there are more students with scores between the first and the median than the third and the median. No, it's 25%. It's the same. There's the same amount of data here as there is here. The, the data in this region right here from the median to Q3, it's just more spread out, but there's not less or more data there than from the median to Q3. E says the scores are more spread out between the first and the median than between the third and the median. Now, that's actually backwards. Literally, I just got done talking about it. 
there is the same amount of data here as there is here. And from the median to Q3, it's just more spread out. So E has it backwards. So D is the one that is correct. There are approximately the same number of students with scores between the first quartile and the min. That would be down here as there is between the third quartile and the max. And again, even though the left side is longer or wider, that just means it's more spread out, but there's still 25% of data in each one of those four chunks. All right, that's it for the video. Hopefully it made sense and hopefully you enjoyed it. And hopefully these questions are really gonna help prepare you for the AP exam.